Okay, so what I really do is plant salt marshes where I can get away with it. But Miriam asked me to deliver a lecture that isn't quite about the techniques of planting a salt marsh. It's more about how I actually managed to get together all the stakeholders with a vested interest in those salt marshes. So that's why I came up with, it's more about coastal management, partnerships, policy and practice. But before that, let's have a look at the habitat. Now, that's what a really nice salt marsh looks like. Um, really lovely zonation going on there. You've got here, this is the sand, what would be the sand dune habitat, terrestrial grasses, um, but the golf course is there. That's the embankment of the golf course on the Eden Estuary. Um, here, this is the mid marsh. This is Puxinellia maritima, salt marsh grass. Uh, it's really lovely in summer. It's covered in sea aster and sea plantains and scurvy grass, all sorts, quite a variety growing there. And then down here is the low marsh. This is um, salicornia. That's the one that people like to eat. But estuaries like the Eden Estuary are under a lot of pressure. And that's what a salt marsh can look like. And unfortunately, that's what salt marshes are beginning to look like more and more. So it's cheating a little bit because that last photo was in the summer, so it looked very pretty. But this one is in the winter. So this, there's the, there's the embankment. This is what you'd call the mid-marsh again of Puxa, Puxinellia maritima, salt marsh grass. So in the summertime, you can imagine that will have flowers growing on it. It can look nice. But whether winter or summer, this is the low marsh. We should have a pioneer marsh here, and there's absolutely nothing growing there. And because that's all fragmented, died back, it dies back first, the vegetation dies back first, and then it begins to fragment. And whether summer or winter, nothing's going to grow on there. The plants cannot recolonize that. It's compacted, it dries out, it's too hot, basically. And in the winter time, when you get the most damage, there's an awful lot of turbulence going on. And all this can do now is start to fragment. It'll break up. The turbulence is the, the water swirls round and round in somewhere like that. You can actually see this little lump here, lump of salt marsh there. And nobody has been measuring the rate of retreat. The last we brought was in the 1990s, and it was about a metre a year. Um, I've been watching it now for the past 15 years, and I don't think it's been retreating at that that speed. Uh, it would be interesting to know what the retreat is, but it is only a matter of time before that whole front edge is gone, and then the waves are coming into the mid-marsh, and eventually that same process will happen, and then the waves are coming up onto the embankment, and the salt marsh isn't doing its job of protecting the land. Uh, there's Fistuca rubra there as well. So the pressures on the Eden Estuary, same pressures on estuaries all over the country, industry, public use and access, habitat degradation, as you've just seen, the loss of biodiversity that goes with that, and then that's not even beginning to mention climate change and natural coastal processes that are being halted as a result of the degradation. So here's the Eden Estuary. Um, it's a small pocket estuary on the east coast of Scotland, uh, just north of St Andrews and south of Dundee. Uh, as you can see here, that's looking south, there's the Firth of Forth. The Eden is very small in comparison. Um, and the reason it's under a lot of pressure is because it's high value land all the way around. Um, I'm going to go into the landowners in a minute. High value land. But the estuary itself is high value conservation land. Um, it's, it's famous, it's mudflats for, for all its waders and wildfowl, and then, yeah, the North Sea out this way. So the landowners, who are they? We've got the Ministry of Defence, formerly RAF Lucas, we've now got a tank regiment, we've yet to get to know them. Um, St Andrew's Lynx Trust, they head up a multi-million pound tourist industry in North East Fife. Farmers, it is high value arable land, it's wheat crops, they're not cheap, it's not potatoes basically. And it's the University of St Andrews these days. They bought out the former paper mill at Guard Bridge, a community at the head of the estuary, and it's soon to be a biomass facility. But we've also got the management of the estuary itself. That's Fife Council, kind of think of them as the overall owners of it. Um, they certainly put in action 
the plans and the Eden Estuary Local Advisory Group, of which the councillors sit on. The person responsible for actually running the estuary, the reserve management, is uh, the body is Fife Coast and Countryside Trust. We've got Scottish Natural Heritage, they're our statutory conservation authority. Those are the three that are really involved in the day-to-day -day of the estuary. But we also have SEPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, and we've got Marine Scotland. They don't have an awful lot to do with its running. But if you want to put anything into the water body, if you want to move sediment around, you certainly have to consult them as well. So that's the landowners and the management. We've also got the designations. It's quite a few things, really. It's a local nature reserve. It's a triple SI site. The N just means it's a national designation. And the I's are international designation. The RAMs are site for the wetlands. And an SPA and an SAC. In other words, quite heavyweight um, legislation that come with a lot of obligations. Look at all the policies, strategies, plans, whatever you want to call them. They all mean pretty much the same thing. It means that um, we have to look after it in some way or other. I'm not going to go through that list. But then we've got the objectives. So we've really got two groups is how I break it down. We've got the conservation lot and we've got the landowners. But the objectives of the landowners, they're actually quite different, the two objectives. Protect land from coastal flooding and erosion, and that's it. They have a right to want to do that. Conservation, they want to protect the wildlife and the habitat. So things like this. This is a breach in a seawall and the field behind flooded. That costs a farmer about £75,000 to repair that damage. It was worth it to him because that's high, arable, high value arable land. Likewise, St Andrew's Lynx Trust, their seawall was degenerating. They had to come and put in a new one. They had no choice about that. But then here, Scotland's one managed realignment site, uh, most successful managed realignment site, I should say, this is what the conservationists would like to do, set back the land and restore a large tract of intertidal. But where my interest lay is the fact that it's the local authorities who actually have to do both. They're under legal obligations to do both. They have to defend properties from flooding, but they also have to conserve nature. And I'm not quite sure how they reconcile those two. So. I looked in the shoreline management plans. They're not legally binding in Scotland, but if you're a landowner, you certainly are told to consult them. That's what you would go to if you're a landowner. So what is an SNP? It's essentially a coastal defence assessment. Um, sorry, that's not quite as clear as it could have been. So here is, this is outhead. This is the golf course effectively. Um, and as you can see, it, they, they break the coast up into manageable units and basically they have a walk around and they have a look at what the defences are. And you come up with these three, there's three categories, there's poor, fair and there's good. Um, and this is what the map of it looks like and then it gives you a typical photo. But the policies... There's three policies, basically, based on three epochs, your epochs being 0 to 20 years of flooding, flood scenario. It's either, here we are down here, 20 to 50 years, and then there's 50 to 100 years. I'm mainly interested in the 0 to 20 years. And as you can see, it doesn't really look good. It's going to flood, is what they're saying. So the three policies to do with that are either going to be do nothing because the defences are good, or there's hold the line because the land is extremely valuable and it's worth the money. Because don't forget, it, the local authority will have to help fund this to actually protect this land. It won't just be the golf course. And then you've got retreat the line, which is great because it targets conservation. It'll put back some, some salt marsh. Um, in the case of outhead, what they've picked here is hold the line because the land is so valuable. So if, when they have the money, that's what they're going to do. But then back to this, something that was missing from that shoreline management plan I found was things like this, where it says dunes, sand vegetation, fair. As an ecologist, I wouldn't call that fair. From a defence point of view, that's fair. That's good enough. But as an ecologist, that's dying back. 
the vegetation isn't healthy. And it's the same where I work, and you'll see pictures later on, this embankment down here, they're gabions, they're calling it good. It wasn't particularly good. Again, beach foreshore, salt marsh, they're calling it good. Well, I'm going to show you some photos. It isn't good. So where do we go from there, from the shoreline management plan, when it seemed to me there's only two options in coastal management, and they're both a little bit conflicting. You can either set back the land and have nature, or you can defend the land, but you need hard engineering. So here we go, hard engineering, the benefits and the disbenefits, and before you ask that is a word. Um, protect and stabilize the land edge. That's the benefit, that's the, the basic benefit of hard engineering. It will. It might not last for that long, but it will protect that land. And the other benefit there, obviously, is the coastal engineering companies, which in this day and age, they, they need to have work. So that's good work for them. Manage realignment, restore large tracts of intertidal. Yep, it'll do that. Within two to three years, it will be back to an intertidal habitat. And so the party line goes, it will also alleviate coastal erosion and flooding. But the disbenefits, look at them. Loss of upper shore habitats, wave and tidal energy increase, shore profile lowered. That one's quite important because the shore profile is, you want it to be like this. You're going to have to describe this to them. <laughs> <laughs> and it will slowly get lowered. And as it becomes lower, the actual seawall itself will start to get undermined. So you're going to have more energy, more turbulence going on there. You've got your sediment transport processes are halted. In other words, the shoreline will become starved. Um, that means no plants can grow there. Coastal squeeze, the big one we all know about. Habitat migration, if it wants to go back, it can't. Formation is halted. Um, and basically, it'll start to erode if it's in the vicinity of that seawall. We know this. It's incredibly expensive. The latest figures I could get were anywhere between, three, actually, it was 3.8 and 5.2 million pounds per kilometer and it does actually have a short lifespan by comparison 20 to 30 years you can leave it longer some places do they can be 50 80 years old but they're not in a very good way even managed realignment has disbenefits obviously the land has to be available um, it isn't really around the Eden the land has to be cheap enough to buy around the Eden it isn't and public approval, we're an island nation, that bit's really important, you have to get the public on board. Hard sea defences are still necessary, they, have, they can be lower, they don't have to be as high as say a 6 metre seawall, they can go down to 4 metres, but they do still have to be put in. So you're still going to incur quite a lot of engineering expense. And this bit, there is no guarantee against flooding and erosion elsewhere in the estuary, that hasn't, that's, that's yet to be proved that it will actually do that. I'd actually rather not call it managed realignment either. I think we should really call it floodplain restoration. It says a bit more, the public might agree with it a bit more, we'll get it. So, there's a lot of research gone behind all of that policy and practice. We have our hydrologists, they're giving us more and more accurate flood scenarios. The engineers, they're the ones who have all the JCBs, and the designers, who will give us good sea defences. And then, of course, the environmental scientists who try and make sense of it all. But there's still only two solutions, as far as I could see. And I kind of wondered if we can restore fragments of sand dune habitat. And we certainly can. Here we go. An award-winning beach. And behind it, the most famous golf course in the world. And then this very thin line of dunes. It was being degraded. It was being degraded because sheer visitor numbers, we're talking about thousands and thousands of a footfall every month. Um, invasive species, <coughs> excuse me, the odd storm, that blew quite a few holes in it. And so where there's a will, there's a way. So the West Sands Partnership got everyone together, found some funding, and this is what it looked like in 2010. And a year later, and as far as I'm aware, it's still thriving. It's looking good. Um, so we can restore fragments of sand dune habitat. And we can even restore the original courses of river. This is now having millions of pounds of funding gone into it. 
This is the Rottle Burn in Angus, a region just north of Dundee, kind of the foothills of the Highlands. Uh, again, it's not a very clear photo, but the old river was straightened and it ran along the line of these trees. Here was the ancient meander. Um, hydrologists and engineers came together and they put the old meander back in it. They cut some channels from the straightened river and environmental scientists are measuring it all and seeing what's happened and seeing if it's worked. Um, and we've also got, it's the Pearls in Peril project, so the landowner is also now responsible for bringing back the freshwater mussel, to, which is an endangered species, it's a bat species. And again, the word here, catchment partnership. So if we can restore sand dunes and we can restore fringes, fringes of sand dunes and we can restore rivers, why not fringe salt marshes? And I really like this image here. This kind of says it all. Here's what a fringe salt marsh can do. There's a fringe, and there's Fife's coastal path here, and that embankment, there's nothing wrong with it. There's no erosion going on on the embankment. Same with this side. This embankment, however, is collapsing, because for some reason, there's a gap between these marshes. Here again, that's on the Eden, sorry. Here again, this is Skin Flats, uh, the fourth estuary. We're looking west there, so Edinburgh's out the way. Um, Grangemouth, Scotland's big oil refinery, is just up the road from that. And this is a very, very, very old um, seawall. This is probably well, built in the 1810s, 1820s. And here's some salt marsh in front of it. The salt marsh looks okay. If it wasn't there, I think there'd be a few holes that will have been blasted by storms into that seawall already. It is that salt marsh that is protecting that seawall. If that salt marsh starts to go, then the way the shoreline management plan would have it at the moment is that the farmer would either want to build a high seawall, he'd have to replace that seawall, and because he's farmland, he doesn't get any help. The council is under no obligation to help farmland or transient communities like caravan sites, actually, either there's the two. So he would have to do that himself, and we'd lose all that as a, as a crop. The conservationists would say, well, just let's flood that. Let's get rid of that wall and flood it all. But the minute you do that, and we've seen it up in Nig Bay, a realignment site up in, up in the north, um, you will, any remaining salt marsh on the edge will just disappear. Um, as, okay, so you, you replace it inland. But I kind of can't help but wonder, but why wouldn't we try the easy option first? the cheaper option, which is simply to manage this fringe in the same way we will manage fringes of sand dunes. If the salt marsh is present, and this is from the research, we know there is nothing inherently wrong with the environment, at least not at the moment. We know that at the moment, certainly in Scotland, salt marshes can keep pace with sea level rise, and more than anything, it's been done before and it worked. How's it been done before? It goes right back to the 12th century Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. They knew that they, yeah, they knew that they could plant salt marshes on mud flats. So 800 years ago, they knew they could do that to claim some land back. It was also then you'll all have heard of Spartina Anglica. It's kind of a bit of a big baddie in the plant world. Nobody likes it. I can understand why they don't like it. It's uh, invasive. It will outcompete native plants, it chokes ditchways, it can basically run rampant over a mudflat. And when you've got a high value mudflat like the Eden Estuary, nobody wants that. So here it is, 1948, it was planted by, a, oh, I beg your pardon, in 1948 it was planted by a botany professor, Professor Graham at the university here. And here it is in the 1980s, flourishing. It was around that time that there was a change of opinion on invasive species and it became a systematic eradication of it. So it disappeared and we certainly can't use that or plant that anymore, we would be shot. Um, we also then, in the 19, mm, anywhere between the 1930s right up to the 1980s, large marshes started getting created in the USA, especially by the Corps of Engineers. And here's one. This was planted in 1974, and this is it in 1995, so it's about 20 years old, 21 years old there. And I Google mapped it recently just to find out if it's still there, 
and it is still there, and it's still flourishing. And if you have a read of the paper, you'll find out that that is actually fairly exposed. This is Chesapeake Bay. It is a fairly expo exposed area. So it was, if they can do it there, why can't we do it? We have done it. We've done it. Direct planting is sometimes used in managed realignment sites, so we know a little bit about it. We use it in mitigation policies. Uh, so the main thing for us up in the Eden was can we find an alternative native salt marsh species that can do the same job as Spartina anglica? And that was where the research came in. So I am just racing through this bit really. Trial plots of different species, planting times and densities. I looked at growth rates between natural and created marsh and I looked at the sedimentation rates just to see if it was going to be sustainable even in the short term. Um, so here we have, up here, this is what one of the sites looked like many years ago. And if you can see all the debris and the cliff line here, this is an old rubble cliff on the North Shore bordering the RAF base. Um, we have very distinct erosion scars going on. And this is what it looked like about 10 years later. We've got the shore profiles beginning to be raised. The accretion is happening that we hoped. The vegetation here is actually beginning to creep down. We have where there was no plant species there at all, we have now about two or three different species have come back on that foreshore. And these, look at these tires. These are the tires and they're beginning to get buried. The plants are doing the job that we wanted them to do. Same, likewise, on the south shore in front of the golf course. Again, it was eroding, it was fragmenting. And it's a very flat profile, the run up there. And 10 years later, this is what the trial plot looked like. Um, the erosion behind, it's, it's helping to mend the coccinellia, the salt marsh grass behind it. And you can, there's a very distinct mound of accretion going on in there. So that was the research behind it all. So that led to the first partnership. And I guess answering Miriam's question more, how did I do it? I think it was about communication, gaining their confidence because they saw those trial plots and then some goodwill because they wanted to do it um, with the primary stakeholders. So the first on board were, was really RAF Lukers, oops, I beg your pardon again, RAF Lukers and St. Andrew's Lynx Trust. SEPA came on board, even though they're not a particularly big player in the estuary, they're not that involved. They were on board because it's a water environment fund. And there's, there's a lot of nasty things in the old dump site on the north shore of the estuary. So they were concerned about that getting washed out into the water body. So that was, that hence their interest. So the first project, it was to just make the first attempt at turning the research into practice. We tried longer lengths in front of wave swept hard defences and that helped to reconnect salt marshes on degraded foreshores. Some facts and figures from that project. Uh, we planted 550 metres of degraded shore. We used 167 volunteers plus me. 156 hours of volunteer hours, those aren't my hours. We dug and we carried 1,492 plugs and we separated and planted over 12,000 sprigs, a sprig being the very basic planting unit. That was over five planting sessions in three years. Um, Whoever did the counting for me on the last planting session was the one that got the 614, which I thought was a bit OCD, but never mind. It was interesting to know. And here's the happy volunteers. Some, this is who you need, university students, Scottish Wildlife Trust digging, more students digging. And these are these plants, Bulbachinus, I should say. I probably haven't introduced you to them. Sea club rush. And these are in a trailer that is loaned to us by the St Andrews Lynx Trust every year and they pull it up to the planting site. And so here, this again is that rubble cliff I was telling you about on the North Shore, the RAF base is behind it. And this is a degenerating seawall on the golf course. The old course is just here. So, so as I said, the most famous golf course in the world is in danger, is right behind that wall there. Again, Scottish Wildlife Trust volunteers planting it for me, and here's some greenkeepers planting it for me. By then, they'd mended their seawall, um, so that was good. 
uh, we, we kind of worked together as they came along and mended the seawall, I came behind them and planted a marsh. And that was over three years we did that. And this is the North Shore. That's what it looked like immediately after planting. The photo, that's just a flip of that. And that's what it looks like in summer. And it's very pretty, isn't it? Um, I'll show you the next one before I say any more. This is the South Shore. Again, doesn't look much, whoops, beg your pardon, doesn't look like much when you first plant it, but that's what it'll start to look like in April and May. Um, yeah, there's, other, there's a lot of other facts and figures in there. It doesn't always look like that. There is such a thing as smothering in the summer, which will kill some of them off. There is what we call the washout rate. That happens every winter. Um, you have to calculate for that washout rate when you're planting. You try to minimize that by having very high density and by making sure they're very well planted in, they're dug in. But at the end of the day, even sand dune planting and um, contract planting in the States advise not to promise any more than 50% um, success rate. I was very lucky with some of my areas. I got more like 80% rate, but not every... But as a, winter, as a winter comes and you get a storm, you might lose some more, so then you have to go and patch it up. It's a rolling program, is what I'm beginning to find. So that led me to the second project, Salt Marshes on the Fringe, and it's twice the money in half the time, unfortunately. But I'm quite certain, because there's a will now, because I've got so many volunteers on board, because all the stakeholders want to be involved, we should be able to get it done. And this time it's even more ambitious. Here's the rubble cliff, the original trial plots in the rubble cliff. That's it on the south shore. And this is what I'm attempting to do now. These long stretches, Guard Bridge and Cobbleshore Embankment, are over a kilometre long. I'm not promising to plant all of that. We are putting trials in. We're putting small areas and seeing what happens there. And the second load of funders on board are the Scottish Natural Heritage and Bike Environment Trust. So it's kind of back to Merriam's original question, how did I do what I did? You need, coastal management needs appropriate funders. You're not going to get that just from research, and you're not going to get commerce either. So it has to be a bit of a mixture. So how were they persuaded, this mixture of funders? Because we did research, and that proved it. There was policy out there that dictated it, and there was partners more than anything that needed it. And all that means that on the Eden Estuary, at least, we really do have ICZN in practice. And more than anything, I guess, it's back to the research, because we're also beginning to refine the knowledge base on ecosystem services. <laughs>